So let's get right to it. Um, we're gonna start this lecture by talking about hearing. Um, it's the sense that we're gonna go the most in depth in, um, above and beyond, obviously, vision. Um, and so when we're talking about hearing, we're asking the questions, how do we take a sensation based on sound waves and turn it into perceptions of things like music, people talking, actions, whatever it might be, right? How do we distinguish among the thousands of pitches and voices and actually make sense of what all of this is looking like in terms of, of what we are actually hearing? So with that said, there are three kind of different components that our ears are interpreting um, and taking in these different waves and types of sound waves and converting it into what we know as sound and what we can interpret or perceive as music or, or communication or whatever. Um, so you have frequency, amplitude, and complexity, right? Frequency corresponds to our perception of pitch. How high is somebody's voice, right? Or how low is somebody's voice? This is perceived by the length of the sound waves, right? If you think back to vision, right, how we see color and how we see movement and how we see depth, all of those things are kind of, are different, right? And how we see, um, how we perceive these things. Same thing with hearing here, right? So the length of the wave, if it's a long, um, slow wave, it's going to be a lower pitch. If it's um, a higher frequency so that the, the waves happen more often, right, it's a higher pitch, right? The next one then is amplitude and that's our perception of loudness, right? It's measured relative to the threshold for human hearing um, and that's set at zero decibels. The rustling of leaves you heard measures about 20 decibels, um, whereas my voice in most conversations measures at about 40 to 60 decibels, right? You'll find out more um, about decibels and common sounds a little later in the presentation, but here's an important decibel tip. Enough exposure to a sound above 85 decibels can cause hearing damage. We're gonna talk about two different types of hearing damage here moving forward, um, but generally speaking, we're looking at amplitude um, as our perception of loudness, right? Obviously, if the um, height or the, um, I think the term is amplitude, but the height of uh, each wave if it's higher, it's louder. If it's smaller or shorter, right, it's going to be quieter. And then the last one here is complexity, and this corresponds uh, to our perception of timbre, right, the quality or resonance of um, a sound. And really that's just like if you have a bunch of different frequencies coming in at you, um, the complexity is going to be less than if you just have one single thing that you are listening to, right? Um, when we're looking at these three properties, we know that of the three that, that are on this screen, um, frequency provides us with the most information that we need in order to identify sounds. It measured in cycles per second um, and is perceived by humans as pitch, but both amplitude and frequency give us further insight into like what that pitch might be like referring to, right? We can get the most um, information out of frequency, but amplitude and complexity give us kind of the holistic understanding of, of how we perceive these sounds. So here is the basic makeup of the ear. You have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And this is how we're going to kind of reference how the sound waves actually reach the ear. The outer ear collects sound and funnels it 
to the eardrum, right? Your outer ear is really like what you can see. Um, like if you're looking at a brother or a sister or mom or dad, like what can you see on their, on the side of their head, right? That's your outer ear. The middle ear then is kind of that next stage in. So if you're like cleaning your ear with a Q-tip, right? And you get that like weird sensation where you're like, ow, right? That's going to be your middle ear. That's where sound waves hit the eardrum and move the hammer, anvil, and stirrup in ways that amplify the vibration. So the stirrup then sends the vibrations to the oval window of the cochlea and the cochlea is in the inner ear. So do note that um, you're not going to have to be able to like recognize the difference between hammer, anvil, and stirrup, um, but do note that you may need to reference that those are part of the middle ear um, and that the goal for them is to really hit those vibrations um, within the eardrum so that your inner ear can then really start the interpretation process. So then, like I said, last piece here is the inner ear, um, and this is waves of fluid that move from the oval window over the cochlea's hair receptor cells. Uh, these cells send signals through the auditory, ner auditory nerves to the temporal lobe of the brain, right? The temporal lobe being your where you're um, interpreting sound, right, right, kind of in the back, middle, above your ear areas of your brain. Um, but you can see, right, if we're looking at this, sound waves come in, they start vibrations in the eardrum, right, and those vibrations then make, what can I do here, like little waves um, in the fluid in your inner ear that kind of wave around some of these like hair-like things that are in the inside of your ear and those then feel the waves. They feel how fast they are, how big they are, um, and they then send those neural impulses into the um, brain itself for interpretation. So you have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And we're going to look more at these, um, especially when we talk about hearing loss, but let's kind of move on for right now from the actual biology of and look at the actual, how we perceive these sounds. So loudness, right, we know refers to the intensity of sound vibrations. Um, this causes a greater number of hair cells um, to send signals to the brain. So right in that inner ear, right, all of a sudden the fluid is moving faster, more hair cells are being activated, and so they're sending more um, signals to the brain. And then on the flip side, softer sounds only activate certain cells, um, whereas those louder sounds move those hair cells and their neighbors. So it's kind of like a chain reaction when we're talking about um, what those look like. And so within the inner ear, right, you have the cochlea, which is lined with these little hair cells that's surrounded by fluid. So when that fluid moves because of the vibrations from the middle ear and the eardrum, right, we then see um, this transition into neural impulses into our temporal lobe for our own perception. So there are a couple of theories here in terms of our perception of sound um, that you are going to need to be able to reference, and those are place theory and frequency theory. Um, basically, when we're talking about place theory, it's this idea that within your cochlea, so in that inner ear where all those little hair cells are, right, that cochlea uh, different areas of the cochlea are stimulated when different um, frequencies are heard, right? So the brain reads pitch by reading the location where the signals are coming from. So on that cochlea, if you're hearing like a really low pitch, a part of the cochlea is going to be um, activated. And so the brain is going to interpret, okay, it came from this area of the cochlea, which means it's a low pitch, right? Whereas a different pitch would, like a really high pitch, would come from a different area of the cochlea because it came from that area of the cochlea, that area was stimulated. The brain says, okay, I know that that area of the cochlea is um, related to higher pitch or what have you. So the place theory says that at high sound frequencies, signals are generated at different loca locations in the cochlea depending on pitch, and the brain reads that pitch by reading the location where they're coming from. Pretty straightforward. Frequency theory then says that at low sound frequencies, hair cells send signals at whichever rate the sound is received. So we know that the auditory nerves impulses corresponds to the frequency of a tone, which allows us to detect pitch. So like how fast those little hairs are moving um, 
essentially gives our brain another interpretation of what pitch we are hearing. Basically how it works, right, the sound waves cause our basal or membrane on the cochlea to vibrate at different rates, which ultimately then causes the neural impulses to also be transmitted at different rates, right? So we hear a musical note and it causes specific vibrations in our ears that lets us hear that specific pitch, okay? Place theory says that our brain interprets pitch based on where, the co where on the cochlea um, the little hair cells are activated and frequency theory says that depending on how fast the frequency is coming in that's going to interpret or um, determine how fast the hair cells are going to move which then the brain says okay the hair cells are moving really fast this is a high pitch or the hair cells are moving really slowly that means this is a low pitch yeah the last piece on this slide is the volley principle and this basically says that at ultra high frequencies receptor cells fire in succession combing signals to reach higher firing rates. Combing, I think that should be combining. Now this one, the volley principle, you don't really have to like know and you won't be, it won't be necessary for you to like break down and define it, um, but it does give us some insight into like the greater understanding of how our ears work and basically this idea um, that at really, really high frequencies, um, the nerve ultimately can reflect a more rapid frequency of stimulation than any individual fiber could follow. So instead of one specific like hair or like st stimulated area um, in terms of neurons, like one neuron can't carry such high frequencies. So it kind of bounces that high frequency from one neuron to another to get it um, to where it needs to be processed, right? So that volley, it's volleying back and forth between neurons because a single neuron can't handle that high of a frequency, so it kind of has to disperse um, the stimulation, if that makes sense. Again, focus on place theory and frequency theory. Volley principle just gives us insight into like kind of the extreme of our hearing in terms of like really high pitch um, or really, really low pitch. So then the last kind of piece of this perception um, as it pertains to hearing is our localization. So note, you have loudness, pitch, and now localization in terms of how we perceive sound. Um, sound usually reaches one of our ears sooner and with more clarity than they reach the other ear, right? The brain uses this difference to generate a perception of the direction the sound is coming from, right? This makes sense. If a bell is ringing, and that sound, those waves are traveling through the air and it hits our right ear and it's very clear in our right ear. Then it hits our left ear and it's a little bit uh, softer because it had to travel further, right? We are going to know that the bell was on our right side, right? This is something our brain does on its own. We never are like, huh, my right ear really perceived that clearly and my left ear like couldn't hardly hear it at all. That's essentially kind of the name of the game. Again, this is pretty intuitive, I, at least I think. Um, we know where sounds are coming from based on where in our, our, our ears they are um, going to be stimulated. And the right ear in this case is going to be more quickly and more clearly stimulated than the left ear. Um, we also know, like again, this is something that our brain does by itself, the time difference from it reaching our right ear to our left ear uh, can be as small as one one hundred thousandth of a second um, and this can cause our understanding of localized sound. The head acts as a partial sound barrier creating a shadow like you see in this image um, in which sounds are delayed and are not as loud. Again that's one one hundred thousandth of a second can our brain can perceive that difference and localize where the sound is coming from. So with that we are going to shift our perspective or perception, mm -hmm. we are going to shift our attention to hearing loss. Um, we're going to talk just briefly about these two types and then I'm going to have you watch two quick videos that break down um, conductive hearing loss versus sensory neural hearing loss. But basically what you need to know is conducted conduction hearing loss is when the middle ear isn't conducting sound well to the cochlea. That's when your eardrum is struggling to pick up on those vibrations and then send those vibrations to the cochlea. Um, conductive hearing loss is generally caused by like 
excessive and long-term exposure to really loud sounds. So people who go to a lot of like loud concerts um, or listen to their headphones really loud, if they get hearing loss, it's probably conduction hearing loss. On the flip side, sensory neural hearing loss is when the receptor cells aren't sending messages through the auditory nerves. The most common reason that somebody would get sensory neural hearing loss is just age, the aging process. Um, I don't know if you've noticed like grandma or grandpa, uh, you talk to them and maybe they don't hear you very well or they say like, oh, talk into my right ear, that's my good ear. It might be because they're experiencing um, those receptor cells right in the cochlea not receiving that message. Again, that's just part of the aging process. So you have conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss. Now you are just gonna watch um, two brief videos that break down what each is because you will need to be able to distinguish between them. Uh, once you watch those, we are going to shift our attention to the chemical senses of smell and taste. What is a conductive hearing loss? The outer ear is the external part of the ear. It collects sound waves and directs them into the ear through the ear canal. The middle ear transmits the sounds from the outer ear to the inner ear. A conductive hearing loss occurs when the ability to conduct sound from the external and middle ear into the inner ear is reduced or lost. One of the most common causes of conductive hearing loss is a blockage in the external ear canal for example, because of earwax. Other causes of conductive hearing loss can be infections of the ear canal, a damaged eardrum, very small ears, cysts and tumors, or even foreign objects in the ear canal. A conductive hearing loss can also be caused by diseases, damage, and physical changes in the middle ear. Luckily, many cases of conductive hearing loss are temporary, and most can be cured. However, if you think you have a conductive hearing loss, you should contact your family doctor. You can find out more about conductive hearing loss on the world's leading website on hearing and hearing loss, hearit.org. In our inner ear, we have a lot of tiny hair cells that move and pick up the sounds that we hear. The movements are then converted into signals that are sent to our brain. Sensor neural hearing loss results from damage to or reduction of the number of tiny hair cells in the inner ear. One of the causes is aging. We all lose some of the tiny hair cells in the inner ear as we age. Another major cause is noise. Noise can damage the hair cells in the inner ear. Diseases such as mumps, meningitis and Meniere's disease can result in a sensor neural hearing loss. Certain drugs like aspirin, cisplatine, quinine, and some antibiotics as well as certain types of chemotherapy can also cause a sensor neural hearing loss. Sensor neural hearing loss can be inherited and finally you may lose your hearing ability due to head or ear injuries. A sensor neural hearing loss cannot be cured, but people with a sensor neural hearing loss may benefit from the use of hearing aids. You can find out more about sensor neural hearing loss on the world's leading website on hearing and hearing loss. Hearit.org. So the chemical senses of smell and taste, we're going to start with taste. Um, and actually, we're going to go with what the textbook currently has. Um, psychologist's perception of taste has changed since this came out. Um, and right they've come to the kind of consensus that there aren't necessarily um, taste buds that receive of the, these like five different um, types of taste, which are sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and they just added umami, which is like savoriness. Um, and this is, again, a little bit outdated, but at the same time, like it's easy for people to grasp and understand because like we know these tastes, we've, we've tasted these tastes. Um, and we know that our tongues have receptors um, for these five different tastes, um, which may have had survival functions, right? If you taste something bitter, often, like generally speaking, poisonous things out in the wilderness aren't like super tasty, right? Generally speaking, they're like bitter berries and um, it's given evolutionary psychologists an opportunity to kind of think about um, the relevance that this had over in the past, um, right? To avoid those types of foods. 
Um, if we were in class together, we would actually probably be doing um, a super taster experiment. There are these little like strips that um, you like rub on your tongue and one out of five people is considered a super taster. You're not looking at me right now, but I'm doing a pretty aggressive hair flip because uh, I am in fact a super taster. Um, and basically what it does is it tests your receptors to see if you are picking up on um, the taste on the paper. Most people like lick the paper and like are like, what? I'm just licking paper at this point. This is weird. Um, but the one in five who are super tasters, it is terrible. I remember when I did the experiment, I couldn't get rid of the taste for like three hours. And they say that um, if you are a super taster, that's probably a reason why uh, you maybe don't like mushrooms or other really um, bitter kind of high taste foods. Um, they say that generally it's not your fault. It's because your taste buds are just taking in more flavor than others. So it's difficult for you to um, actually like some of that stuff. Like I don't like mango or pineapple. It's just too flavorful for me. Like give me a cantaloupe or a honeydew any day of the week. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with me being a super taster or just being a weirdo, but that is the case. There's also another fun experiment that um, we could have done. And it's the, uh, I don't even know how to say this, it's the Gemina Silvestre tea. Um, it's a type of tea that they've like used in diets all the time, but it basically like mutes your sugar taste. Um, it inhibits your sweet receptors. And so what we would do, we'd taste some of the tea and then um, you would try different foods and you would see that like it actually can't mute that sweet receptor, which is kind of interesting. Just something fun to think about. Um, but when we're talking about taste, this is kind of really the only conversation we're going to have about it. It's pretty basic. Um, we know that there are no regions of the tongues, just different types of receptors. Um, we know these cells are easily triggered to send messages to the temporal lobe of the brain, right? The temporal lobe, um, not only the lobe that interprets hearing, but also interprets taste. Um, we also know that receptors reprodu reproduce every week or two. If you've ever burnt your tongue, um, it takes a couple of days for your, like, if you really burn it good, like, or like if you eat pizza, hot pizza, and like the cheese burns the top of your mouth, ooh the worst but if you burn your tongue right it takes some time for those um, receptor cells to reproduce um, and then the last piece to kind of think about is this idea that top-down processes can still override neurochemistry if we expect something to taste good or bad our brain will probably perceive that food to be good or bad right expectations do in fact influence taste so kind of interesting conversation about taste we're going to just hop right into um, the olfactory process in the sense of smell. Um, we know that humans have a poor sense of smell as it pertains to like the entire world. Like animals have a way better sense of smell um, than we do. Um, even so, humans have 350 different types of smell receptors that allow us to uh, detect about 10,000 different odors. So you can see um, if you smell something, it goes up into your nose, it hits the olfactory bulb straight into the olfactory nerve, um, which then kind of, it does a beeline, I guess it's a shortcut through the brain that goes uh, straight through the thalamus um, and is perceived as smell. Um, and so again, this is just a basic overview. You will not need to know like the specifics about um, how our brain interprets smell. You will need to know though um, that smell in fact goes straight through um, the thalamus and kind of skips the neural pathways of all other senses. I um, mean the reason for this it's it's processed not only in the temporal lobe but through the limbic system and that influences memory and emotion, right? This makes sense, right? If you think about when you think about like home or going to grandma's house, like memories and smells are very closely um, attached and aligned. And that's because our limbic system, our, our, like our main like memory and emotion, um, I can't think of the word, where our memories and emotions are kind of stored and um, react, emotion, emotional reactions are um, engaged. I can't, apparently I can't think of the word. 
whatever, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's also where our smells go through. So um, oftentimes smells have very distinct um, memories tied to them. Like um, if you remember doing like baking cookies at grandma's and like the smell of snickerdoodle cookies reminds you of grandma's house or like the smell of roses reminds you of the time that you went to a rose garden in Amsterdam or like whatever, right? Um, so we know that smell is the shortcut sense because it goes through the limbic system, not just um, to be processed in the temporal lobe. So then the last sense we're going to look at is um, the sense of like touch, okay, body senses. This is touch, pain, vestibular, and kinesthetics. Kines kinesthetics is right. Um, so touch, we're going to kind of breeze through this real quick. Um, touch is valuable for expressing and sensing feelings, for sharing affection, comfort, and support, for detecting the environment in multiple ways, such as pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. These are the four components of touch, um, and basically this is just our way to kind of perceive the world um, around us, right? If something is painful, if something is hot, if something is um, uncomfortable because it's squishing us or if it's cold, right? These are the components of touch that our body is perceiving and making sense of the world around us. One thing about pain is that it tells the body that something has gone wrong. Pain often warns of severe injury or even just shift position in a chair to keep your blood flowing, right? When you're like, um, you get like cramps sitting down like on a chair or in a couch or something for like a long period of time, right? that can be long-term detrimental for you. So your body says like, ow, this is hurting, so that you adjust and you don't have that long-term issue, right? Um, this video is actually of a young girl who doesn't feel pain. Um, there are people, many people, well, not many, it's a, very, it's a pretty rare condition um, for people to not feel pain at all. Um, this girl is one of those people who have been diagnosed with um, a disorder that limits her ability to feel pain, but there are also people who have um, sensations of pain even when they're not injured, right? Um, one example of this is the phantom limb um, scenario in which people who have had like amputations for whatever reason um, actually feel the pain in that limb even when their limb isn't there. Um, and it's the nerves telling your body that there's something wrong, right? And that pain can be felt, um, and it's it's a very real pain um, that people have to deal with when they have phantom limb syndrome. So with that, right, on one end, people feel pain excessively, and on the other end is this young girl who doesn't feel any pain at all. So how is it different parenting a child with no pain? You have to constantly be aware. You have to be aware visually because she is legally blind. And she's legally blind because she poked her own eyes. Exactly. She has a scar mm -hmm. over the remaining eye. Her vision is less than 2200. And that happened because obviously your parents are watching, but obviously there must have been times when she was poking on her eyes and you didn't know. You'd look away for one second and she'd just have her fingers in there, especially with the stitches when she kept trying to pull stitches out as a baby. Yeah. Thank you. We keep her in pediatric arm restraints. It's a, a Velcro cast that would go around her arm to keep her from bending her arm. Uh -huh. If you can't bend your arm, you can't reach your eyes. We'd duct tape those on at night, and she would still get them off in the morning. We'd come in, and she did scratch her eyes. When did you first notice that your baby felt no pain? Well, when she was uh, in the hospital, they, they do the K-test uh, yeah. the very next day where they poke okay. a heel, yeah. and she, she slept right through it. And then as she got a little older, well, the nurse says, wow, what a good baby. She's still sleeping. Yeah. Well, she didn't feel any pain. Yeah. And then as she got a little older, We'd wake her up in the, in the crib in the morning and she'd be amazingly cold, which is a different part of the condition. She doesn't regulate her body temperature very well. Uh -huh. I mean, we'd wake her up in the morning, she'd be amazingly cold, but then she'd wake up and be fine and warm up and didn't think nothing and of it. And she doesn't feel weather either, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. She can walk she'd out She'd do the door. really well in Chicago. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a funny joke I made, yeah. <laughs> but that's the problem. She can walk out on a sunny day, even at our home where it can be very cold and she'll say, I don't need a coat, the sun is shining. And then but, you're tangled. Oh, she, and occasionally if it gets too cold, she feels a sensation she calls tingling. So we know it gets then. too cold. You see on my phone right here. So I heard she had a broken jaw and you didn't even know it because? There were no symptoms. She was just slightly subdued. 
Um, she was getting little fevers that would come and go. And then finally one night, Steve said, you know, her jaw, there's a red bump here. Has she fallen or something? Um, we'll never know. You don't even know. The doctors estimated it had been broken for about a month. So with that perception of kind of, of pain, um, we have a couple of theories, well, a theory and some ideas. I already referenced the phantom limb sensation, so we're not going to talk a ton about that again. Um, but the gate control theory says that uh, the spinal cord contains neurological gate that blocks pain signals or allows them to pass on to the brain. The gate is opened by the activity of pain signals traveling up the small nerve fibers and is, con and is closed by activity in larger fibers or by information coming from the brain. Stimulating large nerve fi fibers in the spinal cord through acupuncture, massage, or electric stimulation seems, clo seems to close that gate. So that was a lot of words and a lot of text to kind of define this idea that basically we know that small nerve fibers are pain fibers, whereas large nerve fibers are normal fibers for touch, pressure, and other skin senses. Um, and basically this is saying within our spinal cord, there's like a gate, quote unquote gate, that um, determines which signals get sent to the brain, right? Um, and this particular theory is tied closely with phantom limb sensation um, because of this idea of large versus small fiber, nerve fibers, um, and what message is being sent up into the brain, but it's also um, used to talk about um, our psychological influences on pain. Um, and that like, if we think something's going to hurt, it's probably actually going to hurt worse than if we thought it wasn't going to hurt, if we're surprised by it. That's why when you're at like the doctor, or like when little kids are at the doctor and they are counting down to three to give you a shot and they go one, two shot before you hit three, it's because your expectation is that they're going to poke you at three and you're not expecting it at two and therefore it hurts less um, because you're not expecting it. Um, with that said, right, when we're talking about the gate control theory, um, we're really referencing this idea that there is some sort of neurological process that distinguishes between which pain signals, which signals should be let through as, ouch, this hurts and like, oh, I feel pressure. Um, or I feel coldness or whatever that might be. Um, so with that, the psychological influences on pain are real and they've done many studies and, and have done a lot of research um, looking at this. Um, and basically, we know that distraction um, can limit the experience of pain, right? So if you're uh, an athlete and, and it's the championship game and you're so focused on winning the game but you sprain your ankle, um, you might forget that you sprained your ankle until after the game when you don't have anything else to think about and then you're like, ow, that really hurts. It didn't hurt that bad while I was playing, right? Um, we also know that memories of pain focus on peak moments more than duration. It's not like, oh, I say you broke your arm. You don't think about like the entire process. You think about like the immediate moment when your arm broke, right? Um, lastly on this slide, tapered pain is recalled as less painful than abruptly ending pain. So like something when you like, I don't know, like dislocate a shoulder and it like, it hurts really bad at first, but then the pressure goes away once you pop, pop it back in, right? That is seen, it's remembered as like painful, but not as painful as something that, um, maybe like a, a sprained ankle, like a high sprain, a really bad one that lasts a really long time and doesn't really get better. It still hurts. Pulled hamstring. Oh, those are the worst. Pulled hamstring would be a really good example of that. Um, so just recognize these psychological influences on pain are real and they've been studied and we can think about them um, through the lens of that gate control theory and that like when our brain is focused on other things or when our brain is thinking about um, what the expectation for pain is going to be, our brain is, our, our spinal cord, that gate is more willing to let through pain, like pain, um, nerve action potentials, right? When we expect something to be painful or not. Um, so then shifting from that just basic sense of touch to kinesthetics, kinesthetics, kinesthetics. Yeah, that's right. 
don't know why I thought that was around. Um, this is basically the movement feeling. Really, this is just referring to the sense of movement and position of individual parts relative to each other, right? How it works, sensors in the joints and muscles send signals that coordinate with signals from the skin, eyes, and ears, right? When you walk, you pick up your feet and you bend your knee and you um, adjust your hips, right? All of those things are part of kinesthetics. Um, and without that, we would need to watch our limbs constantly in order to coordinate movement. Instead, we know when our body is moving. We know when we're picking up our foot. We can sense that. We don't need to like see our physical foot lifting off the ground to take a step in order to know that we have taken a step. That's the basics here, right? This man juggling, right, is showing I'm focused on the balls. I don't have to really think about where my hands are. Um, yeah. So with that, we're going to do a couple of little activities to get you really thinking about this particular sense of, of our body senses in terms of uh, kinesthetics. Um, so you're going to first close your eyes and raise both hands above your head. Okay. You're going to just do this with me. You might feel like a crazy person because you might be alone in your bedroom or in the basement or wherever you are and you're going to do this because it's going to be fun. You're going to close your eyes and raise both hands above your head. Keep your eyes closed. Keep the fingers of your left hand totally still. You cannot move or wiggle your fingers on your left hand. Then, with your right hand, quickly touch your index fingertip to your nose, and then quickly touch the tip of your thumb to your left hand with the tip of your right index finger, okay? So your eyes are closed. First, take your right index finger, we're not moving our left hand, right index finger, and touch your nose, okay? Then I want you to quickly touch the tip of your thumb of your left hand to the tip of your right index finger. Okay, I want you to quickly repeat the entire process while attempting to touch each fingertip. Always return to your nose between fingertip attempts. So right index finger touches your nose, left thumb touches your right hand's fingers. Keep your eyes closed. Okay. How successful were you? Did you improve with practice? Right. These are the questions that we're thinking about when we're thinking about kinesthetics. Right. Most individuals have some trouble with this task and the other demos because we often don't depend on, on this sense alone. Right. Because um, we also use our vision. We're always looking at things and we're very rarely like walking around with our eyes closed trying to like make active movements, right? Wiggling your fingers and your left hand was not allowed because it sends additional signals to the brain about the location you are looking for during the task, right? Makes sense. Okay. So there's one. We're going to do one more and this is a handwriting analysis. So in your notes, wherever you're at, um, on a line sheet of paper, I want you to write the word proprioception. Proprioception is the act of these proprio sen uh, sensors, which are the cells that, um, translate kinesthetics, right? They're the cells that actually are perceiving where your body is and how your body's moving and they're sending those impulses to the brain, right? Once you've written proprioception, I want you to place your pencil on the same line next to the written word, close your eyes and write proprioception again. Okay, close your eyes, write it again. Is there a difference in the appearance of the two written words? Probably. Right. But there's probably some similarities too. like we've had uh, so many hours of our lives have been spent writing things um, that it's kind of like muscle memory. Right. When we're talking about these particular examples, right, we're using proprioceptors in our muscles, tendons and joints to judge our body positions in whatever the activity is that we're doing. Right. Since most of us are also highly dependent on visual cues for judging distance or like the position of our bodies, kinesthesia um, as a sense alone isn't enough to give us that fine detail of position, right? Such as needed to, to complete these particular activities that are like pretty specific in terms of like, you could probably walk with your eyes closed. That's a pretty basic thing, but trying to touch your fingertips, trying to write a word without those visual cues, it's very difficult because we don't normally depend on this particular sense all by itself. So with that, we're going to shift into our last, um, kind of sense as it pertains to touch. And this is the vestibular sense, um, which refers to the ability 
to sense the position of the head and body relative to gravity, including a sense of balance. This is really like, um, if you've ever heard of like vertigo, when people like get dizzy or like feel like they're going to tip over, or they like feel unbalanced, right? That's because there's probably some issue with the vestibular sense. And the vestibular sense, while a sense of like our touch is also related to our ear because the fluid filled chambers in the inner ear, those vestibular sacs um, that surround the cochlear, um, have hair like receptors that send messages about the head's position to the cerebellum, right? The vestibular sense serves as the human gyroscope, um, helping us to balance and stay upright. So if that fluid is like at an angle, right? If you can envision like, Right here is like whatever your um, where the uh, fluid in your inner ear is located. If the fluid is straight, right, and it goes straight across, we know that we're probably upright and we're balanced, right? If all of a sudden the fluid does a little bit of this and it's not straight, we know we are tilting to the left because there's more fluid on the left side, right? So that's basically what our vestibular sense is doing. Also, if you've never like Google searched um, acrobatic gymnastics, um, you should because it's insane the competitions that these people do, right? Like what they're able to do and balance on, phew, crazy. Um, so with that, we're going to take all of these and mix them together. There is um, the idea of sensory interaction, which occurs when different senses influence each other. For example, a burst of sound makes a dim light source more visible because if we have a loud sound where our brain is stimulated, those neurons are stimulated and we are more easily able to perceive like a lighter or dimmer light. We also know that flavor is an experience, not only of taste, but of smell and texture, right? I'm sure you've seen like little kids having to eat broccoli. They plug their nose and they eat the broccoli because if they can't smell it, it doesn't maybe taste as bad. Um, with that all kind of in mind, right? Obviously we know that um, our senses interact. We see and we can feel where our body's at. We can, if we see a book drop and we hear a book drop, we can put an understanding to what is happening, right? We hear a loud noise and we see a book drop onto the floor. We know somebody dropped their textbook. But there's something kind of crazy that also exists within how our brains work, and it's pretty rare. It's called synesthesia, and is it's a condition which perception in one sense is triggered by a sensation in a different sense. Some people experience synesthesia all the time, reporting that the number seven gives them a salty taste, or that rock music seems purple, right? Or that um, the word college tastes like bacon or whatever. Um, we're going to actually watch a video that gives you an overview of what synesthesia is and what are some examples. Um, but it's pretty crazy. And um, there are some other YouTube videos, if you're interested in it, that like show what synesthesia looks like for people who have it. Maybe kind of like a VR virtual reality like experience, um, but it's pretty interesting. So this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle bringing everything together, right? We've talked about vision. We've talked about hearing, smell, taste, touch. So then what, when we bring all of these together, right, we have sensory interaction, but we also have kind of extreme cases such as synesthesia that we're going to talk about here in this video. And that's, that's it for this chapter six. Imagine a world in which you see numbers and letters as colored, even though they're printed in black. In which music or voices trigger a swirl of moving colored shapes. In which words and names fill your mouth with unusual flavors. Jail tastes like cold, hard bacon, while Derek tastes like earwax. Welcome to Synesthesia, the neurological phenomenon that couples two or more senses in 4% of the population. A synesthete might not only hear my voice, but also see it, taste it, or feel it as a physical touch. Sharing the same root with anesthesia, meaning no sensation, synesthesia means joint sensation. Having one type, such as colored hearing, gives you a 50% chance of having a second, third, or fourth type. 
One in 90 among us experience graphemes, the written elements of language like letters, numerals, and punctuation marks, as saturated with color. Some even have gender or personality. For Gail, three is athletic and sporty. Nine is a vain, elitist girl. By contrast, the sound units of language, or phonemes, trigger synesthetic tastes. For James, college tastes like sausage, as does message in similar words with the idge ending. Synesthesia is a trait, like having blue eyes, rather than a disorder, because there's nothing wrong. In fact, all the extra hooks endow synesthetes with superior memories. For example, a girl runs into someone she met long ago. Let's see, she had a green name. Deezer Green, Deborah, Darby, Dorothy, Denise. Yes, her name is Denise. Once established in childhood, pairings remain fixed for life. Synesthetes inherit a biological propensity for hyperconnecting brain neurons, but then must be exposed to cultural artifacts such as calendars, food names, and alphabets. The amazing thing is that a single nucleotide change in the sequence of one's DNA alters perception. In this way, synesthesia provides a path to understanding subjective differences, how two people can see the same thing differently. Take Sean, who prefers blue-tasting foods such as milk, oranges, and spinach. The gene heightens normally occurring connections between the taste area in his frontal lobe and the color area further back. But suppose in someone else that the gene acted in non-sensory areas. You'd then have the ability to link seemingly unrelated things, which is the definition of metaphor, seeing the similar in the dissimilar. Not surprisingly, synesthesia is more common in artists who excel at making metaphors, like novelist Vladimir Nabokov, painter David Hockney, and composers Billy Joel and Lady Gaga. But why do the rest of us non-synesthetes understand metaphors like sharp cheese or sweet person? It so happens that sight, sound, and movement already map to one another so closely that even bad ventriloquists convince us that the dummy is talking. Movies, like Lloyd's, convince us that the sound is coming from the actors' mouths rather than surrounding speakers. So, inwardly, we're all synesthetes, outwardly unaware of the perceptual couplings happening all the time. Cross-talk in the brain is the rule, not the exception. And that sounds like a sweet deal to me.